Right now on KCCI 8 News Close Up, the status of the Des Moines Public Schools. Our guest this morning is Superintendent Tom Ahart. The challenges facing the district and what he's looking forward to this upcoming school year. And he has overseen major, major development in Iowa's fastest growing city. Why Waukee Mayor Bill Peard is not running for re-election. KCCI 8 News Close Up starts right now. This is Iowa's news leader. This is KCCI 8 News Close Up. Good morning. Thank you for joining us. He oversees the largest school district in the state, and this morning he's here with us to talk about the status of Des Moines Public Schools. Tom Ahard became superintendent back in 2013. Prior to that, he was the principal at Harding Middle School. He's also served as a director of human resources for the Ankeny Community School District, and he spent 11 years as a high school teacher. Superintendent Tom Ahard joins us now. Thank you very much for being here. It's a pleasure. So school has just kind of just gotten started. What are you looking forward to uh, for Des Moines Public Schools this year? Well, we have uh, three really pretty significant changes, um, which we, we uh, announced in January of last year, but net we're now experiencing those in real time. We made a, uh, a, another change to the elementary school start time. So we went from 7.30 a.m. last year to 7.45 a.m. this year. We were able to figure out a way to eke out another 15 minutes in the morning. To, uh, to make the hopefully the morning routine a little bit more smooth for those families that have kindergarten through fifth grade students. Um, so far that's working quite well. Uh, another big change was the, a change in the high school master schedule. So we, uh, for, for many years, we have, we've been running a four by four block schedule where students have four long classes on one day and then on every other day they have four different classes that met for between 85 and 90 minutes. Uh, for a variety of reasons, we changed to what we're calling a modified block schedule, where students take seven classes rather than eight classes over the course of a semester. Um, each of those classes meets for some short periods on some days and longer periods on other days. Um, we did that for a variety of reasons. Uh, our students were telling us that they, they felt like they needed stronger relationships with their teachers, and so that the modified block gives us an opportunity for our students to spend more time in each class over the course of a week with each of their teachers, hopefully building um, better collaborative relationships. It also increases the uh, number of instructional minutes that our students receive on uh, any given week. So we hope to improve academic outcomes um, in, in that regard. And then finally, um, our calendar is different this year. For a very long time, the district has been running an early release Wednesday afternoon where um, schools were released two hours or, or an hour and a half earlier, depending on the year, earlier than the other days of the week in order to create time for teacher professional development. Um, this worked out well for us in terms of teacher professional development. But we learned that it, it inconvenienced some of our families who really rely on, um, on their students being in school for the full day um, because daycare is sometimes a bit of a challenge on, on, a, on a day that is a one-off from the rest of the week. And we also wanted our students in school for the full afternoon to uh, prevent hopefully some some poor decision making by some of our older students when they have a little <laughs> bit of extra free time to roam around the city. Um, what that enabled us to do, however, was to capture those instructional minutes. And so we actually have fewer days of school this year than in previous years because we're able to count those minutes that before we had to subtract for that professional development. So we think that's going to be overall um, a really positive all, all the way around. Okay, the district has also expanded the free meals program to include more schools. How great is the need in the Des Moines district and uh, what has the reaction been to this move so far? Uh, interestingly, uh, when, when we rolled this program out at a smaller number of schools, uh, I guess it was about five years ago, uh, we were anticipating um, more of a reaction than we actually received and so at that time, we tried to project when sc different schools would become eligible to participate in that program, assuming that if our first year went well with those schools and we saw the benefits that we thought we would, that we would, we would, have, uh, we would be on a timeline to add additional schools to the fold. And what we've actually done this year is, is move up the timeline 
uh, we actually took in some more schools that originally we had planned on not um, bringing in until last year. The good thing about that is um, it saves a tremendous amount of administrative costs and it really makes all of our students feel more comfortable because we're not having to delineate between students who qualify for a free or reduced priced meal and those that don't. So overall, um, we're able to feed more students and, um, and we're able to do that more efficiently. The bad news is that, that um, more of our schools are eligible because the poverty rate in, in the uh, district continues to increase. So last year we, we cleared the 76% mark for students that qualify for free and reduced price lunch. Um, we, we don't have the, the um, official count this year yet. That won't happen until sometime in October but we, we uh, anticipate seeing that number continue to climb. And so that's the, you know, that's the bad news. Yeah. Let's move on to athletics now. You've sure. contacted the governing bodies for girls and boys sports here in the state of Iowa, yeah. asking that they look into how conferences are divided up. Explain mm -hmm. that. Well, um, I'm not sure when uh, when states started started uh, creating classification systems for for athletics, but it was done really on a on a the, the basic reason that was done was to ensure that um, schools weren't weren't um, more advantaged, you know, than other schools that they were playing against. So that there was, in, in essence, a level playing field and everyone had an equal chance if they put in the time and the effort and the energy to be successful. Um, what, what I and, and several others are arguing is that we really don't have a level playing field anymore. Um, and so there, there are different uh, methods that people have suggested to to balance how we classify schools, my my suggestion is just to factor in um, some some rate of poverty. Um, the reason that's important is if you just take enrollment, um, that doesn't anywhere near tell the full story. So if you have a, uh, a a school that may have the same enrollment as you know, if school A has the same enrollment numbers as school B, but school A has a much higher uh, poverty rate. Um, the likelihood that those students who are participating at, at school A have had the same opportunities as they've worked their way through the system to participate in club sports, to, be, um, to belong to um, activities that have helped them to, to develop their skills and abilities in that particular sport are probably greatly diminished. Also, the, um, the percentage of students who are in a position to actually participate in an extracurricular activity because of other responsibilities, whether that's taking care of younger siblings or whether they're required to work to you know, help their family support their opportunities, um, you just don't see um, the, the, the enrollment numbers don't tell the full story. And what are you hearing from the athletic unions, the athletic associations about this? Uh, well, so far we really haven't heard. Okay. Uh, we really haven't heard anything and they won't meet on that topic I think until later, that, later this fall. But we've had a, a number of coaches and athletic directors and superintendents from around the state that we've been discussing this with now for uh, since, since, about, uh, since about the winter of last year. And uh, there are a number of states around the country that already do some sort of um, adjustment in their, in their classifications. And we just think it provides more of our students an equitable opportunity to experience success. And, um, and, in, and frankly, in the case of football, to not, to, for me, to not put students in harm's way. Okay, and we're going to take a break. Our conversation with Superintendent Tom Ahart continues after this break. Welcome to Unity Point.
And welcome back. We are continuing our conversation with Des Moines Public Schools Superintendent Tom Ahart. And what level of parental involvement do you see here in the district? We all know it's very important to student success. Uh, mm -hmm. Is the parental involvement where it should be? You know, our, uh, I, I speak about this quite a bit. Our, our not only do our parents give us the best that they have, they're, they're sending their, their students to us, um, they're also largely engaged as well as they're able. You know, we have a lot of families that are, are working when, where both available parents are working full time, sometimes more than one job. So oftentimes their, their, um, their willingness to participate is not matched by their ability to participate because of um, working, working late shifts or working more than one shift. So uh, we always strive to get additional parental engagement and better par parental engagement. Um, and so that's something that we're constantly working on. Um, but we also recognize that a lot of our families would be more active and more engaged if they simply had the time. So let's go to funding right now, uh, something that we've heard schools talk a lot about sure. for a number of years. The state spends more than $3 billion on K-12 education every year. Um, do public schools, do Des Moines public schools get enough support? You talked about the 76% who now qualify for free lunch. Well, I, w I would argue that we don't. Um, I think that um, overall it's, it's very easy to see if you, if you look at a trend line over the last um, 40 or 50 years of how the state has supported education, whether you um, whether you look at just the percentage um, of supplemental state aid, what used to be called allowable growth, which is the, the, um, the, the amount of increase in, in base level funding from the state, whether you look at it that way or whether you look at school funding as a percentage of our gross domestic product in the state, um, you just can't make the argument that as our challenges have increased, um, particularly in Des Moines, but not exclusive to Des Moines, state support has diminished. And so I would argue that, that overall state funding is, is lacking and lagging behind. Um, perhaps more importantly though, I think that our state, uh, our state does a, a wonderful job, probably better than any other state in the country, of funding every single student, regardless of zip code or school district or part of the state, exactly the same. What we do a, an embarrassingly poor job of is recognizing that the pathway for every student is different. And so we can't make the assumption that all of our students have um, all of the advantages that perhaps um, we had or that most of our legislators had when they went to school. And so a student who's coming into into a public school that um, perhaps doesn't speak English as a native language and doesn't speak English at home requires additional support and resources than, than my children to, to be successful and, and achieve the same outcomes that we hope for all of our, our students. And if they have, if they uh, are coming from a disadvan economically disadvantaged home, there are things that, um, to, to provide equitable opportunity, or there are things that the school district must, must um, provide that perhaps um, other school districts don't need to provide. So what is the adequate amount? What's the ideal amount? Well, I don't, I, I, I'm not sure I'm prepared to speak in ideal terms. Um, I would probably sound uh, really Pollyanna-ish um, <laughs> <laughs> I, if I dream big. But there are states like Minnesota, for instance, who have a base formula much like Iowa does. Every student generates a certain per pupil amount of funding. Um, in Minnesota, um, this isn't precisely what happens, but essentially what happens is if a student, every student uh, generates the same amount of funding, if a student qualifies for a reduced price lunch, they get that base funding plus 50%, and if a student qualifies for free lunch, they get that base funding times two. So um, they recognize on the front end that in order to provide an equitable experience and certainly to provide equitable outcomes on a reliable and ongoing basis, different students require a different different level of resource. Okay, do you get the impression from the legislators as you talk with them that they are looking at educational spending as an investment in the future or something a hole that just needs to be filled? Uh, well, generally speaking, um, we're moving more toward, you know, in the last 10 years we've been moving more toward the latter than the former, I would argue. You know, it used to be pretty uh, a, a safe assumption that the first, very first priority of the legislature, every legislative session, was to determine state funding um, for public schools and then move on to the rest of the priorities. And now we're trying to compete with a whole host of other um, potential priorities every year, and oftentimes um, we get the short end of the stick. 
All right. Tom Ahart, thank you very much. We appreciate your time today. We know you're a busy it. man. Well, up next, we go one on one with Waukee Mayor Bill Peard, why he has decided not to run for re election. Stay with us. We've been in this late legal community here in Iowa. Welcome back to KCCI 8 News Close Up. Our next guest is Mayor of Waukee, Bill Peard. Mayor Peard has lived in Waukee for nearly 25 years. He was first elected mayor in 2006, and before becoming mayor, he served two terms as a Waukee City Council member, a total of 22 years in office. And Mayor Peard joins us now. Thank you for coming in. And this week you announced after more than a decade uh, in office as mayor that you will not run for re-election. So why step aside right now? Well, thanks for having me, Cynthia. Um, you know, the, the thing um, I guess somebody needs to realize is that when they have done what their goals were to do, that it's time for a fresh set of ideas and fresh eyes looking at our situation. Um, I, f I leave this place, um, my office uh, in Waukee, I think in a really good spot. I mean, it, it's growing like crazy. There's, there's so much new and good stuff coming that my wife and I kind of debate, had this discussion all summer with, along with my two boys. And they just said, you know, dad, it's, it's time to, you know, to pass the baton. So. And when you first started out there, it was a sea of farmland. Yeah. Um, big changes. The population has jumped 166% since <laughs> you took office. We yeah. looked it up. And uh, why do you think so many people are flocking to Waukee? Well, I think it's, you know, the one thing I've always done as mayor and as, a, as council person is thank everybody along the way because nobody no one person and myself included made Waukee what Waukee is Waukee is a great community it has virtually no crime it has excellent school systems it has a community feel to it so so I've had people come up to me over the years say we just love Waukee and thank you for for serving and it really is not 
it's a pleasure to serve. It's it's not an obligation to serve. Um, so, so I think that's, I mean, that's why Waukee um, has been so successful, and, and, and the school district has been a big, big part of that because people are coming because they're moving out for the school districts. You know, the kids get a qual great quality of education. Both my boys went through it. And now I think you're seeing the grandparents moving from other parts of the state <laughs> so they can be close to, to the kids. grandkids. So. And not just uh, yeah. residents walking there, but businesses as well. Absolutely. Why is it so attractive to businesses? Because they, they, they see new frontiers. All these people, they need the services, you know. Um, banking, chiropractic, you know, m movie theaters, entertainment, restaurants. I mean, so they're they're catching up with the the population that needs these services. So, and of course, one of the biggest yeah. businesses, Apple, yeah. um, and you've been proud of of working to get them established there. What do you think the that data center once it's established will bring to Waukee? You know, it's that's hard to say um, because of the type of business that that will be coming to Waukee under the Apple guidance. Um, I think we're going to see more people or more businesses come in because of economic development um, in Waukee. They're going to move there because Apple's there, and so it's attractive for them to come there. So you'll see a lot of cottage industries, hotels, and more restaurants, and um, those kind of things that okay. are going to follow Apple. I always love more restaurants, and yeah. we're going to be taking a short break, and our conversation with Mayor Bill Peard will continue next. With change comes opportunity. Oppert Welcome back to Close Up. We're wrapping up our conversation with Waukee Mayor Bill Peard. And Bill, 22 years, a long time, 14 years as mayor in Waukee. What are you most proud of? Well, I th I'm most proud of, of uh, the type of development that we have um, attracted in Waukee. Um, I s very few towns or cities get the opportunity to paint a blank canvas. And in Waukee, when I started, Waukee was a blank canvas. It was a small town, kind of a kind of a sleepy little town, but a but a great little community. And now the people are coming and the growth is happening. And so we're able to plan um, Waukee out to where it makes sense and is is it's a beautiful type of uh, 
yeah. community. And I'm going to name a couple of projects that yeah. you helped us uh, see through. Mm -hmm. And just a quick reaction, the yeah. Grand Prairie Parkway, that was your baby. Yeah. It was my baby. I, I started uh, going out to Washington, D.C. and lobbying our federal delegation to get that interchange in the Grand Prairie Parkway Road from the interchange to um, Waukee. So the, the, absolutely, that was my baby. That's probably the core. And then that led to more development of, along Ellis's Road and yes. up toward Hickman. Yeah. Just explosive absolutely. growth. Absolutely. It was because of um, a lot of that explosive growth in Hickman is because they knew that Grand, that Grand Prairie Parkway was coming and that brought traffic in, because it's about traffic management, that Grand Prairie Parkway, is to get our traffic around the city in an efficient way, so. The new IMAX theater. IMAX, I, I, lo I love movies, <laughs> uh, and so the fact that IMAX invested in Waukee, I think says a lot about our city, um, our community, um, and uh, it's a state of the art. I, I welcome anybody, that, that loves to come to see movies to come out to Waukee and go to one of those movies in the IMAX because it's, it's phenomenal. Is there anything looking back now that you wish you would have done differently or anything you regret? No, because I think a lot of what I've learned and a lot of the experience that, uh, that I have done has, has been a learning experience. It's made me, you know, I think a pretty well liked mayor and and somebody that has the passion if you don't have passion for this job it'll it'll eat you up because it's it's all about fixing things and being community so so no i i don't have very many regrets and you still and there yeah. you're leaving with a lot of projects yeah. on the table yeah. um hmm. trail system hmm. parks right yep you know what? It, at some point, you have to step off and let the and let the new generation of people um, take walk key forward. Excuse me, um, because I it could be 20 more years if I just waited until Waukee had stopped. You know the rapid growth. So I'd be 80 years old. You know, so so you just pick a point in time, and and I'm not unique to Waukee. There's going to be lots of good people um, follow me. Uh, we've got great counsel and great staff, so it's in good hands. And uh, in the Little Waukee Source magazine, you're listed as top 50 best places to live in America, top 10 fastest growing U.S. suburbs, top 10 best for families. The list goes on and on, so um, you can be proud. And, and what do you see as your next chapter, briefly? Um, probably uh, cleaning the house <laughs> and, and and doing some landscaping and and, and you have a full-time job and, the, and I do have a full-time <laughs> job I work for the Iowa Cable and uh, Telecommunication Association as their executive vice president and I do want to give them um, a thank you on the air for allowing me to serve because they've been very good in in my schedule and that schedule. And we want to thank you for serving. Thank you so much. Yeah. And thank you for joining you, us. Cynthia. We wish you all the best. And we hope to see you again next week for KCCIA News Close-Up.